Okay, everyone doing okay? <laughs> now, as I, I mentioned earlier, I, I realize that when you look at the chart here, that uh, there's a lot to look at. And this is not my chart. Uh, John G. Hall, I don't know if very many of you knew Brother Hall. He, he uh, used this chart all over the world. He was over in So Korea, different places, and uh, a, very, a lot of TV programs. As a matter of fact, I was privileged to do 105 TV programs with him just off of this chart, uh, but they were in California and Chicago. <laughs> I wasn't famous except there, you know. <laughs> so um, anyway, he was my mentor, and uh, I've known him since the 60s, and not very many years ago he passed away. But before he passed away, he had promised me that he would give me this chart. This is the second of three charts that he had. The first chart uh, that he had, he, uh, he, uh, he gave to, uh, uh, to uh, Dan Schaefer. Many of you may have known Dan Schaefer uh, uh, at uh, Cathedral of Pre Is that what it was? Yeah. Oh, Crossroad Cathedral, yeah. And, uh, and then this was his second one, which really is the best one. He has a third one that his family kept, which is in a little better shape than this, but nonetheless, uh, this was the one that he did most of his teaching off from. So uh, I, I felt like tonight, rather than just jumping right into the, uh, uh, the book of Revelation, I'd like to give you an overview of the chart tonight, which will encompass the book of Revelation. Because you look at this, and you're thinking, man, I see all these circles and I see all this stuff and I have no idea what all of it represents. So I'm just going to give you a quick synopsis. Is that okay? Now, those that have been in my Sunday school class on Sunday morning, I have a 17-foot chart that is smaller than this. Not, it's not as artistic as this, but uh, I'm teaching off of it. But we've gone through each dispensation and right now we're on the dispensation of law, which we're going to be on it for... Uh, for a little while. So let me just give you a quick synopsis, all right? Now I'm going to say some things tonight that some of you, it may be that you've never heard it, but it doesn't mean that it's not true, <laughs> okay? And I, I promise you, everything that I teach from this chart will all be scripturally based, I, I promise you. Now I know a lot of people are not so concerned to where we've been, they're more concerned to where we're going, but I think it's important that we, uh, that we have a... Uh, uh, a, a little bit of knowledge or a lot of knowledge of, of going back to the very beginning it gives us an idea of what God's purpose and plan was at the very beginning. How many know that if Adam and Eve had not of sinned, they'd still be on the earth today? That was God's original plan. But we know that being created as free, free moral agents, they weren't robots. They had the power of choice. And, uh, and of course, the, uh, uh, the tree of uh, good and evil was set there before them. Uh, as a test. Now, God didn't put it there so they would sin, but it was there, and, uh, and uh, well, I say in hopes, but uh, it, God's perfect plan would have been that they had not eaten of the tree, and, uh, and time would have went on, and uh, they would still be here today. So if we look at God's perfect plan from then to the very end, which we'll get there sometime, okay? <laughs> Uh, it really takes me, just the book of Revelation, it takes me a year to get through it scripture by scripture if I do it in detail. But I, I think I can do it in 13 weeks. All right, so that means you guys are going to have to, I'm going to give you some homework and you're going to be reading the Bible and then you're going to come back with questions and whatever and we're going to discuss those, those questions. So let's go back to the very, very beginning. Okay, in the... Uh, in the dateless past, how many know that the earth could literally be millions of years old? All right. Now, many think that, that the, uh, the uh, six days of, they call it creation. Actually, it's the six days of restoration that we see in Genesis, the first chapter, uh, going to the, the second chapter as well. And when I say restoration, the, the earth was older than what we see here in the restoration. We have to go all the way back to the time when God created the angelic beings. He created all the universe and whatever, all the galaxies, all the planets and whatever. And, uh, and some of you may not know this, but Lucifer at one time, he ruled the earth. All right, how many didn't know that? Well, some of you'd be ashamed to raise your hands. <laughs> all right, most of you, been if you've been here long enough, but it goes all the way back to uh, 
Uh, when Lucifer ruled the earth, that was created. This was his kingdom. You often wonder where the pre-Adamites came from or the prehistoric animal. It would date back to the time that Lucifer ruled the earth. Now, if you look at uh, like Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14 says that uh, I mean, his sin was, I'm going to ascend above the heights of the clouds. I'm going to do this, that, and whatever that showed the pride of Satan. And the Bible says he was cast back down to the ground where he weakened the nations. Is everyone with me? All right, so, uh, and in Ezekiel uh, 28, we see basically the very same thing, that he defiled the sanctuaries. So there was a kingdom here that he ruled. And now let me just very quickly show you what I'm talking about. If, if we go to the uh, six days of, of restoration of the earth, what was it after Adam and Eve was created, what was it that he told Adam and Eve? He said, I want you to multiply and replenish you. So that tells you alone that there was something before Adam and Eve to replenish. Matter of fact, we can go in the same Hebrew words, those same Hebrew words were spoken to, uh, uh, were spoken to Noah. Uh, here he told Noah whenever they came off of the boat, he said, I want you to multiply and replenish the earth. So with that, we, have, we see a kingdom that dates all the way back. If they say the earth is 10 million years old, I don't question it. It could be millions of years old. We don't know. It would date back to this, to this particular period of time. So it all starts right here. All right. Now, those of you that have my book, Journey Through the Bible, I wrote that back in the, uh, started in the 70s, and, and much of what's in there is what I use for my, uh, for my uh, uh, writings that I did for my doctorate degree. But uh, it'll, ex it'll spell all this out and whatever. Most of you probably have, have my book. And it also it has the whole book of uh, Revelation in it and the book of Daniel, which uh, Daniel has a lot to do with what we're going to be studying about. So uh, this is the dateless past. Now, if you look at the chart, everything below this red line all the way to the very end deals with the five different departments of the underworld. If I ask you where is hell, where would you say it's at? It's in the earth, all right, in the, in the bowels of the earth. Whenever Jesus died, he went down where? To the bowels of the earth. He preached to the spirits there and then was resurrected. So there, there are five different departments that, that are there. And now also is included on this is the triunity of man. The triunity of man is that each of us, we, we are a spirit. The real you is the spirit man. You have a soul and you live in a body. Your body is the only temporary part of you. Your spirit and soul will go on forever and ever, uh, whether, whether you end up going to heaven or whether you end up going to hell. It, that was the eternal part that God created whenever he created us. So we see that when you think of yourself, just think of yourself from the standpoint that you are a spirit. If you died... I don't want to say if you died tonight, <laughs> but, but if you died, your spirit and soul would leave your body. Your body has no life in it unless, it unless the spirit and soul is in it. How many understand that? So the body goes back what? To the dust of the earth. Now we know that at the, uh, uh, the rapture of the church, that the grave will give up that body in whatever condition it is, but it'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye and be a glorified body. We'll see that in 1 Corinthians 15 whenever we, we get there, but we'll get there. So uh, this li uh, teaches you a little bit about um, the triunity of man. You are a spirit. Uh, the, the, now I know that there's a lot of teaching out I, uh, and I don't agree with the way, that they say the spirit man is the mind, it's the intellect and whatever. But if you study your Bible, you'll find that, I mean, they say that about the soul. The spirit is the mind, uh, it's the will, it's the intellect. The soul is the seat of affections and emotions and whatever. And, and the two of them work together. They're inseparable, uh, the soul and spirit is. But a lot of them will teach that the soul is the, is the intellect, the will, and whatever. But you won't find that in your body. It says, what knoweth the things of a man but the, the spirit of man? So the spirit man is the part that knows. The seat of affections and emotions are a part of the, the soul. And then you have the body. Okay, and here's the thing. The soul is going to gravitate to whichever way you're living. Uh, if you're living for the world, it's going to gravitate to the carnal part of the flesh. But if you're living for God, it gravitates towards the spirit man. 
Now, maybe that all sounds a little bit Greek to you, but it, it shouldn't because we do a lot of teaching about that. The five different departments of the underworld. There's a place that's called Tartarus. Uh, Tartarus is a place that God created for the very purpose of uh, angels that left their first estate and they're, they're, that's where they're at right now. They're in, they're in Tartarus. There was a sin that they committed. I mean, all of you are looking at me so strange. I mean, just shake your head like this. I mean, I think well, they're, they're really in this with me. <laughs> but uh, uh, we go back, in understanding this, we go back to the time before, uh, uh, before Noah. We go back to that time, and in the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis, it says the sons of God married the daughters of men. Sons of God is used five times in the Old Testament. Only one time does it speak about man, and that's, and that's Adam, because he was a direct son of God. Sons of God are speaking of the angels that left their first estate. They married the daughters of men in the sixth chapter of Genesis, and they're the ones that produced the giants. Now, people will try to argue that and say, well, the Bible says that the uh, angels were created at neither to, uh, to marry nor be given in marriage. It doesn't say that they're sexless. It just says that God's original creation wasn't that they marry and be given in marriage, uh, uh, that, they, that they marry or be given in marriage or whatever. It doesn't mean that they're sexless. So the angels that, that uh, not all the angels, one third of the angels fell whenever Lucifer fell. Not all one third of them who were the sons of God that married the daughters of men and produced the giants. Those that did, they left their first estate. Uh, you can see it in, uh, it's in uh, 2 Peter 2, 4, Jude 6 and 7, and, uh, and also in Genesis 6, the 6th chapter, it talks about that. Now we may, if you ask questions about that, we'll get more in it as far as what the Bible says concerning those things. So there's a place called Tartarus, and uh, it was reserved for the place not created for mankind, simply created for the purpose of those angels that fell and committed that sin of leaving their first estate and marrying the daughters of men, and in doing so, created the giants. And you know, uh, uh, I know Keith, in one of his messages, he mentioned Og. Now, uh, Og could have been as much as, uh, as 18, 17, 18 feet tall. Now, it depends on what you use for a cubit. Uh, a cubit is from the tip of your finger to your, uh, your elbow. Uh, and most people, that's 18 inches. But if you look at a giant, it can be anywhere from 21 to 25 inches. So you look at uh, um, a Goliath. Goliath could have been 9 feet to 13 feet tall. And Og was evidently, the, they say, the tallest because his, bed, his bedstead, the length of his bed was 17, 18 feet long if you use 20, I think it's 21 or 25 inches as a cubit. So I mean, where did these giants come from? Well, they came from the sons of God marrying the, the daughters of men. So then we go to a place in the earth that's called paradise. It's often referred to as, uh, as Abraham's bosom, but it's, uh, uh, if we went to the 16th chapter of the book of Luke, and most of you remember the story of Lazarus and the rich man. How many have read that? All right, Lazarus was a beggar and was at the gate uh, as a beggar, and then the rich man was just that, but he had, uh, he had no association with God or whatever. The rich man died and the beggar died. And so in the 16th chapter, it says that the, the beggar went to paradise and the rich man went where? To hell. That's the third uh, department in the underworld. So uh, uh, while he's there, he lifts up his eyes and looks across this great chasm here uh, between paradise and, uh, and, the, uh, uh, and hell or shoals or Haiti. And he asks that if... Uh, if Lazarus could just dip his finger in water and then touch his tongue to quench the thirst. How many remember reading that? <coughs> and of course he said, it can't happen. The great gulf in between them is impassable. You couldn't, uh, you know, uh, Lazarus couldn't come over here and he couldn't come over there. Now, this has been emptied. Paradise has been emptied. If you go to the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians, it talks about Christ and how he, how whenever he went down into the earth, he led captivity captive. Otherwise, all those that were in, in paradise, he led them to heaven. So if anyone dies today, where do they go? Do they go to paradise or do they go to heaven? Now, how do we know that? I think it's 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. It says, to be absent from the body is to 
be present with the Lord. So if you died whenever, not tonight, <laughs> whenever you die, immediately your soul and spirit is going to go to heaven. All right? And you're going to be with the Lord. Even in the Old Testament, it refers to uh, whenever it talks about how precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. Now, death isn't precious, but it's where we end up when we do die. We're in the very presence of Almighty God. So we don't go to paradise. It's been emptied, all right? But hell is still wide open. And so all the uh, Old Testament people that rejected God that have died would be there. Uh, any that uh, uh, have, have lived since uh, Christ... And his crucifixion, if they have died without Christ, this is where they're at. And, they're, and listen, the place is, is, I mean, is being filled every day with people that have rejected Jesus Christ. How many know that you don't go to hell because, uh, because you've sinned? Now, you go to hell because of your rejection of Jesus Christ, which classifies you as a sinner, I realize that. But you don't go just because you commit sin. You go because you've rejected Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And if you're living for Christ, you shouldn't be sinning. Sinners practice sin, all right? Christians may miss the mark, but we repent of it. Hopefully you do. If not, we'll do that tonight. <laughs> All right. So there's a difference between practicing sin. Armatee, I believe, is the word uh, where you miss the mark. And um, uh, that's the, the Greek word. So there are times we may miss the mark, but we repent of it. But sinners just sin unconsciously. Whenever you as a sinner, you, mem you remember not even being convicted of it. You just did what you wanted. Can you remember that? Then all of a sudden, God gets a hold of your life because mama's praying. And all of a sudden, boy, I made, you got conviction and whatever. And, and I remember the night that, I still remember vividly the night that I got saved. Before that time and this revival, I, had, I looked down, I had my hands on the back of the pew and I was holding it so, I meant so tight that my knuckles were white. Because I knew I needed to go down, but, but I didn't. But the conviction was there. And so I think uh, the next night or second night or whatever, I meant, I, mean, I, I didn't even wait for the pastor to preach, I just or evangelist, I just walked down to the uh, to between two pews and knelt down and gave my heart and life to the Lord. So, so there's a difference between sinners and those that miss the mark. Now, if I ask you, has anyone here since you've been saved ever sinned? Okay, what did you do when you sinned? Okay, did you have a conviction about it? Now, sinners don't have a conviction about their sin. They may have a conviction about rejecting Christ and they need to get saved and whatever. But after I got saved, I was ruined for sinning. I, seriously, I, I, there was nothing I could do. And it seemed like mom knew everything that Robert and I did. I thought, where, she wasn't even there. How would she know? But the Holy Spirit knows. So this is the, the, fir, the third different department. Then there's a place in your Bible in the 20th chapter of Revelation. It's mentioned as the abyss. And the, and the abyss is where there are uh, demon spirits that are held there that's going to be used during the, the tribulation time. When we get into the trumpets, you're going to see that. There are, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this just very quickly. There are the, uh, um, uh, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven vials. And they just get worse as we go, as we go along. And then we have a place that is called the lake of fire at the very end. There'll come a time... There'll come a time when everyone that's in hell will be taken out of hell. They'll be taken to the great white throne judgment of God and they'll be judged and then they'll be cast into the lake of fire. It's referred to as a second death, but they don't die there. It's an eternal death from the standpoint that they suffer forever. There's weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. Think about that. I mean, why would anyone want to go there? And a lot of people don't believe there's a hell. They'll believe there's a heaven, but not a hell. Listen, if there's a heaven, there's a hell. Amen. I've had people say, well, you know, God will just forgive me when I get to the gates. No, he's not going. Once you die, it's judgment. Is anyone listening? All right. So when you're going to get saved, you get saved now. You don't wait and get saved. You know, when you get to heaven, it's too late then. So this is the, uh, this is the, the fifth department, the lake of fire. So uh, what's going to happen? Well, uh, paradise has already been emptied, and we're going to see that, uh, uh, that hell, Sheol, or Hades, it's referred to, is going to be emptied, and all those people will be judged. Now, you and I won't be judged here as Christians. A lot of people have taught that, that everyone's going to be judged here. No, we're going to be judged 
at the judgment seat of Christ. And we're not going to be judged for our sins. We're going to be judged for the things that we have done. We're going to have the, uh, uh, the different crowns. There's a crown of rejoicing, the elder's crown, the, the martyr's crown, which I don't really care for. <laughs> But nonetheless, and the soul winner's crown. So we'll be given those crowns. Now, the Bible does say that uh, we w will be judged in the sense uh, 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 of our works. Is your works, are they wood, hay, and stubble? Or is it going to be gold and silver and precious stone? Now, to explain that just real quick, uh, let's say that you're only working in the church. You're a Christian, but you're only working in the church so people can see you. You know, look what I do. You did it for the wrong purpose, I know uh, Margaret, my wife, has said, listen, you need to do that. God will bless you. And I, I told her a while back, I said, listen, I've got too many blessings already stored up. I don't care, I don't care about this one. <laughs> but you don't want things to be wood, hay, and stubble. That means you, you're going to make it to heaven. That's, you're already there. But you're not going to be rewarded with what you could be if you're doing things for the right reason. I'm teaching this to win souls. I'm doing this. I'm going there. I'm helping in the church. All of that, I'm doing it not, you know, not for the purpose that people will brag on me. I've had people say, listen, I'll work in the church if you'll give me an important position. <laughs> I want to say wood, hay, and stubble. <laughs> you, know, you may make it to heaven, but that's all you're, that's all you're going to have. So anyway, these are the five different uh, departments of the underworld. Now, from, from this red line to this red line are all the events that's going to happen here on earth. Already have happened or going to happen. And then above the red line are all of these things up here. Uh, well, when we get to here anyway, uh, there wasn't enough room to, to uh, put the different kingdoms that have ruled here upon the earth. And we'll be talking about that, but when we get to... To hear you're going to see all the events that take place are events that's going to happen in, in heaven. A lot of great things are going to happen. Now, just, just so you'll know before we touch on this, the next great event to take place, according to Scripture, would be what? Rapture of the church. Now, we're pre-trib in the sense we believe that the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation. And it's very clear in your Bible, and you'll see that. But a lot of them have taught that uh, it's either mid-trib or it's post-trib, which means that you would go in the middle of the tribulation or you'd go at the end. Now, how is this going to work? If, if they believe the rapture takes place here, if they believe it happens here, then you've missed out on everything in heaven. And how can you come back with Christ on white horses if you're not even up there yet? Ever thought about that? And then the, the rapture that takes place, or the, the word rapture is not in your Bible, but the word catching away is. It means the same thing. That's just an English word that we use. The, on, the only catching away that happens in the middle of the tribulation is 144,000 Jews. Now, in the seventh chapter, it, it talks about 12,000 from each tribe. All right, now I'm not of any of those tribes. All right, so it's not talking about me. In the 14th chapter, we see that they're in heaven. All right. So there have been many different catching aways that have taken place. We can go all the way back to Christ. Do you know whenever Christ was resurrected, that there were Old Testament saints also that were resurrected, resurrected at that time? I think it's either in the 26th or 28th chapter of Matthew. It says the graves were open. You know, not just Christ's grave, but graves were open and those people were seen for 40 days in the city and whatever before they went before they went up to heaven. So Christ in 1 Corinthians 15, I don't know, maybe it's 20, 23 or 24. Uh, it says, every man in his own order, but Christ is the first fruits. Now, what does that mean, the first fruits? He had to be the first to be caught up before we could ever be caught up. How many understand that? So he's the first fruits. But it said every man in his own order. So we have, we have Christ. Now listen to me. We have Christ being, being caught up. He went to be seated at the right hand of the Father. And then we have Old Testament saints, not all of them, but some that were seen in whatever. The graves were open and then they were caught up. We know that uh, in uh, the fourth chapter of uh, 1 Thessalonians, it says that the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
then we which are alive and remain will be caught up. So the dead in Christ, that's, they're going in their order. And then we which are alive and remain will be caught up. And then we know that the 144,000 Jews will be caught up. We also know that the two witnesses in the second half of the tribulation, which is seven years of tribulation three in the last three and a half years, we know that the two witnesses, which are Enoch and Elijah, that's the only two men in your Bible that has not died. They're, they're still in the flesh and they're in heaven, okay? And, but they'll, they'll, they'll do great, I mean, miracles during this last three and a half years, but then they'll be killed towards the end of it and lay in the street for three days and then all of a sudden they come alive and are raptured, given a glorified body. But not only them, there's gonna be martyred saints that'll be martyred in the first three and a half years, and they wanna know when they're gonna go, and, and so the scripture is telling them that you're gonna to have to wait, and they wait, and they'll be, they'll be caught up uh, here towards the end of the uh, seven years of, of tribulation. So there's more than just one catching away. All we think about is just the rapture, and then ever, that's it. No, there's different catching ways that'll take place. So we see here in, we see here in the, uh, the, the middle part of this, uh, of this chart, we see that there are, are the six days of, of recreation, uh, and then the seventh day they rested. Man was created on the sixth day, uh, would be at the beginning of the day, and at, towards the end of the day, uh, God gave him a wife, Eve. And, uh, and then we see uh, also prior to that time was the creation of other land animals were created. Uh, uh, would, would have been at the time of Adam or after Adam or whatever or before was created. And, uh, and then Adam named all of them, but his wife was created at the end. Now, a lot of people have taught that each one of these is a thousand years. But it says the morning and the evening was the first day, the second day. And they get that from uh, Second Peter. It says, a day is to the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. All that scripture is saying is that there's no time with God. But you can't get a thousand years out of each one of these. Now, let me show you why. Let's look at Adam. Adam was a perfect age, whatever that is. Probably 60, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was probably, I mean, a perfect age, uh, the scientists have said, has been uh, like 26, 27 years of age, you know. But he was created full grown and whatever, all right? And then we see that uh, they, had, uh, they, they had two sons, but they also had daughters. But we know that Cain killed Abel, okay? And so, now if we're looking at a thousand years, well, that means that if he was created at the beginning of, the, of this day, and then she, at the end of the day, he would have already been a thousand years old. All right? And yet we know that not to be true because Cain kills Abel and then Seth becomes the next son that's in the bloodline. And it says Adam was 120 years old when they had Seth. So that just kills that, doesn't it? All right? So uh, each one of these are 24-hour periods. And we're not going to cover those other than the fact I wanted to tell you that. And then we see Adam and Eve, they're created, they're put in the garden. Here's an interesting fact. They're, they're put in the garden and uh, they can eat of all the trees except which ones? Or the tree of, 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 of knowledge of good and evil. All right. And of course, we know that they, that they ate. Now, listen, you men, you often think, well, if she hadn't have eaten, he probably wouldn't. No, he was right there with her. And the thing was, God gave him all the instructions and everything that they could do. And here's a lot of things. Often people think that they were in the garden maybe for a long period of time before they even fell. There's only one recorded Sabbath, which means that the dispensation of innocence before the second Sabbath, they, they fell. When would be the best time the devil come at you if, you're, if you've just been born again? Not when you've been saved for 20, 30 years and heard the word and whatever. It's immediately, and Satan came to them immediately. The interesting thing was she ate and then she gave to him. He had to be there. He was present and, and he ate. So the dispensation of innocence could have only been maybe a week long. The dispen and so when they sinned, they became what? Conscious of sin. So that's the second dispensation. A dispensation is a probationary period of time where they were tested during that time under certain guidelines of God. Just like Adam and Eve, all they had to do is just stay away from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and they'd been all right. 
And not only that, but they hadn't even eaten of the tree of life. If they had of, they still may be here on the face of the earth today. So we know that it, 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 their sin happened very quickly. The dispensation of conscience uh, lasted 1,656 years. You stop and think how long these people lived. Jared lived uh, uh, 962 years. Um, uh, Methuselah lived 969 years. Noah lived 950 years. And then it starts, it starts lessening as we go on. Abraham, uh, we know that, uh, that uh, Abraham and Sarah, they had their first, uh, well, I say their first, they had their first child. When he was 100 years old, she would have been 90. She died at 127. So that made him 137. It almost sounds like in Scripture that it says that he was old and like his time was up. Well, he marries Couture and has, what, five or six more sons. And then he dies at 175. <laughs> when you look at all this, and so you see that as time goes on, that the life expectancy begins to diminish. So you go to, uh, you go to Abraham, you go to Isaac, you go to Jacob. And uh, from Jacob, his 12 sons, you go to Joseph. Joseph, um, uh, uh, as we get to, to Joseph, we're going to get down here to the, the dispensation of promise. But anyway, we see here 1,656 years is uh, the dispensation of consciousness. Now, we see something major happen. I mean, God was very displeased with what was happening upon the earth. So he talks with Noah. Noah finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. And what happens? He tells Noah to build this ark because he's going to destroy all of mankind. And all that's going to be left is Noah, Mrs. Noah, and his three sons and their wives. And that's exactly what happened. It's almost like starting over again. That dispensation lasted 427 years. Now, as you think of these different dispensations, uh, you can identify them with, with the icons or the, or the people that were a part of that. So if we went to uh, innocence, Adam and Eve. Conscience, Adam and Eve. Human government, it's Noah. We go to promise. Now, who are, who's the major character here in promise? Abraham. So promise lasted 430 years. And, uh, and so we have Ab Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, uh, and then we have Joseph, and he's the one that uh, actually, uh, of course, we see that, uh, uh, that Jacob thought that his son uh, Joseph had been, had been killed, but that wasn't the case. And so he ends up in Egypt, but he becomes the salvation of... Uh, of the lineage and of, of Israel themselves because he's put in prison, but he, he interprets the, uh, the uh, uh, King Pharaoh, he interprets his dreams and whatever, and now he's second in command. <laughs> you know, and uh, a lot, there's a lot just with that. But Joseph brings us in. At the end of Genesis, we see that Joseph dies, and then we go to Exodus, and here we see Moses now. All right, and that's what we've been studying in our class because uh, uh, we're already through getting Israel through the, the Red Sea and we've got them up to Kadesh Barnea now. And, but they're going to go back in the desert and spend 40 more, they're going to spend 40 years because of their rejection of being willing to go in. And, and why did they not want to go in? The giants. Huh? They send these 12 spies and, and Caleb and Joshua were two of them. And they were the only two that came back with a good report. The rest of them said, well, we look like grasshoppers in the sight of these people. And it wouldn't even be safe for us to go. So anyway, they end up spending 40 more years in the, in the wilderness, or 40 years in the wilderness. Actually, they spent 41 years because it took them from crossing the Red Sea three months to get down to Mount Sinai. And while they were there, they got... Moses got the Ten Commandments and then all the instructions to build the tabernacle out at that time. But it took them nine months to get up to Kadesh Barnea. So they was, I mean, they ended up, that's, that took a whole year. So when they went back into the desert, 40 years, 41 years, can you imagine? Because they were afraid to go in. So the dispensation of law is 1,718 years. And so that brings us to the dispensation of of grace. And so that's what we're going to be covering and talking about. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll probably pretty much just jump right into the, uh, into the rapture of the church here, you know, 
because uh, that's what you're interested in, is what's going to happen during the tribulation. I can tell you this, the tribulation speaks of the wrath of God. And whenever it talks about the wrath of God, it, talks, it tells us that He's not appointed us unto wrath, but unto salvation from the standpoint that we're not going to go through the tribulation. Now, whenever, whenever you're, you're dealing with the book of tribulation, I don't want you to spiritualize it, all right, and make it something. For instance, I, uh, I've got all kinds of books in my library on the book of Revelation and the teaching of it. Everyone will take that teaching and spiritualize it and try to make something say something that it's really not saying. For instance, I don't believe that, I, I don't believe that the mark of the beast will ever reach the United States. I don't believe, I don't see any signs of that at all or whatever. But it, there's going to be a lot of things happen here. People's going to be killed. They'll kill you for bread or whatever if you miss the rapture. I mean, there's going to be a lot of things that's going to go on. But, uh, but a lot of people have, have said, no, I, 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 found, I found America or the USA, I found it in, in prophecy. And I, and I thought, well, I wonder where they found it. Well, they said it's in the name of Jerusalem, J-E-R-U-S-A. <laughs> L-E-M. <laughs> and so they take the Bible and they spiritualize it. So when we start seeing some of these happenings that are going to happen under the seals, under the trumpets, under the vials, they've taken that. And they've, uh, for instance, like the, uh, uh, like the, uh, the 200 million, it's under the, uh, uh, the second woe uh, of the uh, trumpets. Uh, 200 million, uh, uh, it talks about an army of 200 million. But this army... Is, is not like a regular army. They said, well, China now has over 200 million uh, horses and, uh, and, uh, and men uh, that will be there during that time. Uh, listen, whenever it talks about the horses will breathe fire out their mouth huh? and all the different things that are supernatural that will happen and whatever, it's not talking about, it's not talking about just normal men or normal horses or whatever. So when we get to that, we'll, we'll cover that as far as the way it's given in Scripture. Is that fair enough? Okay. So a lot of these things that's going to happen during the tribulation have been spiritualized, and that, doesn't, uh, and that doesn't mean that's what the Scripture really teaches. How many want to know what the Scripture really says? You know, whenever it talks about uh, in the, uh, uh, what, the first or second, second chapter, it talks about the, uh, uh, of Revelation. Let me see. I'm, I was there at Revelation. Uh, it talks about the, uh, the seven stars, and then it talks about the seven golden candlesticks. If he just left it like that, it'd be kind of hard to know what it means, wouldn't it? But the seven stars are the seven angels, the word angels, messenger, and it speaks of the seven pastors, all right, of the seven golden candlesticks, which it says, and the seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches, Okay, so now we, we have the meaning of it. There's lots of places we're seeing Revelation where it says something and we look at it and think, well, just a minute, I, I don't understand this. Just keep reading. How many know that God's obligated? If, he, if this is a revelation given to us, God is obligated to give us the meaning of it. How many would, I mean, why would he give us, this is a revelation given to the church, the book of Revelation is. It's not something that's secretive or whatever. And often we'll take the book of Revelation, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll spiritualize it or we'll make it say something that it doesn't say. Let's just simply say, see what the Bible says. In the 13th chapter, whenever it talks about the head that was wounded, they said, listen, that's Kennedy when he was shot and he's over here on an island. <laughs> I mean, how many has heard that? He's over there on an island and he's going to be resurrected. It's talking about a kingdom. It's not talking about a man. And the scripture will tell you that. All right. And, uh, and whenever we get, because um, we'll have to cover some of these things whenever we're dealing with, well, let me just finish this right here. So seven years of tribulation. There's seven seals, seven trumpets, and there's seven vials. And the vials are worse than any of them. And then we have, then we have the second coming of Christ. And then we have the millennium. The 20th chapter of the book of Revelation speaks of this being a thousand years. It's when Christ comes down at his second coming with his saints, establishes his kingdom here upon earth. It's a thousand years. Satan during that time is, is housed or bound in the abyss. The scripture says that. So for a thousand years, here's the thing people don't understand. They think either you, everyone's going to take the mark of the beast or they're all going to be killed. If that's the case, there's no, there's no live humans that are going to go into the millennium. 
Are you with me? No, there'll be people that'll miss the rapture because they'll miss the rapture because they're not saved and born again. They'll get saved during the tribulation. There'll be a lot of people saved. There'll be a revival that'll be going on even that time. Listen, I'll tell you what, this church will be full when the rapture happens. And you can be the pastor. <laughs> no, it'll be full, but I won't be here. You won't be here. But it'll be full because people, I mean, they're going to realize they've missed something. There'll be people that'll be saved during this particular period of time. And they'll be the ones that'll move in to the millennium. Matter of fact, we know that, uh, that Israel, well, I even hate to get on this, but we know that, uh, I think it's in the 12th chapter, it speaks about the sun cloth woman, how that she gives birth to the 144,000 Jews that'll be raptured here. And then she has to flee into the wilderness, which the wilderness is Petra, Edom, Moab in that area. Uh, I can't show it to you on the, uh, I, it's on my chart, but uh, on my chart that I've got in my classroom. But uh, anyway, I, I have it pinpointed there. But anyway, uh, she'll flee and be there for three and a half years huh? and be protected. Huh? And, uh, and so we know that uh, there'll, be, there'll be Israelites that have gotten saved and whatever that's going to be protected. There'll be other humans that will. They'll be the ones that will go into the millennium. All right? And a matter of fact, in Isaiah, uh, see, Isaiah 60, 65, 20, it says, even a child will be considered a child at a, at a hundred years of age. So during this time, life is going, to be, is going to be increased as far as the number of years. If you commit a sin of judgment, you'll be dealt with immediately by Christ. You can't say, well, I didn't do it. <laughs> no, Christ is going to be ruling and reigning, and we're going to rule and reign with him as glorified saints. So, uh, uh, so that's going to be for this thousand years, but at the end of the thousand years, Lucifer is turned loose for a season. That's what it says. Now, when I think of a season, I think we have four seasons, and so a season could be three or four months or whatever, but for a short period of time to tempt all those that would have been saved during that time, and then then what will happen next in the 20th chapter? It's the battle of Gog and Magog. That's when Satan is, is and, and anyone that falls with him is totally and completely defeated. And, uh, and he'll be cast into the lake of fire where the false prophet and the Antichrist, uh, Antichrist is already at. It goes back, to, goes back to the second coming. And then there'll be the renovation of the earth that we see in 2 Peter. And then from the renovation of the earth, we'll be moving into the perfect age. Many people don't know, but the New Jerusalem is a city that God has prepared for us that will come down and set right here upon the earth. And the, even the people of the earth will bring their glory into it, is what it says. And there'll be a lot of things that will happen It's going to be unbelievable to you that will happen during that particular period of time. So anyway, that's the underworld. That's things here upon earth. Uh, we have seven dispensations, but we have five ages. It goes back to, uh, to the anti-chaotic age, whenever Satan ruled the earth. The anti-Diluvian age it goes all the way up to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, the, uh, it goes all the way up to uh, the time of Christ. This is the, the dispensation here of grace, but it's, a, it's an age. And then we come to the millennial age, which is the fourth, and then the perfect age is down here. And this is where we're going to end up. And then there's going to be natural people here upon the earth, just like God ordained when he created Adam and Eve way back there. So, okay. So, we, so anyway, that's a quick synopsis. Can you see how detailed this is? Why it takes me so long to get through all this? Okay. Does anyone have a question? I'll get Michael to help me. He can take that mic right there. I didn't mean you was going to have to ask, ask a question. But if you have a question, he'll bring the mic to you. Anyone have a question? If you don't, I guess I did pretty good. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm covering a lot, and I know I talk fast and whatever. But any question? One thing that we've got a little bit of time. One thing we didn't talk about uh, is uh, the different kingdoms that have, have, have rulership that has existed here upon the earth. The first we have here is the Egyptian kingdom. We know that Israel was very much a part of that because they were under the, the rule of Pharaoh. And, uh, and they were in bondage, uh, Egyptian bondage. But we see that, that later on, Assyria overtook Egypt. Huh? All right? And then we see that uh, Babylonian overtook Assyria. 
And then we have the Medo-Persians that overtook Babylon. Then we have Greece that overtook the Medo-Persians. And then we have Rome that uh, overtook, uh, overtook Greece. Now, the, the boundaries of the Roman Empire are, st are still in force. They're still there. They haven't changed. And then this metallic image here that speaks of Nebuchadnezzar first, who was the king of, of Babylon, uh, uh, it starts here with, uh, with, with Babylon, but goes all the way down to Rome, and then it goes to the revised Rome that hasn't happened yet. Now, on this metallic image, there's, there's, there's two legs and there's ten toes besides the rest of the image. The northern and the southern kingdom, but the ten toes represent ten kingdoms. Right now in the old Roman Empire, there's, uh, there's either 23 or 25 states or countries. Now understand the Roman Empire, when they had it, there wasn't a place called Greece or whatever, you know. I mean, it was... They, they were locations, they were named and, and whatever. It may have been like the northern kingdom, southern kingdom or whatever. But... Uh, but uh, uh, the ten toes will represent during the time of tribulation, it represents, the ten toes represents ten kings that's in your Bible in Revelation. And how that the Antichrist uh, is a part of those ten. He defeats three and the rest of them give him uh, their power, which means it's going to take the Antichrist three and a half years here to get control of the, uh, the old Roman Empire. And then we see that not only is there going to be the revised Roman Empire, which hasn't happened yet, that'll happen during the tribulation, there's going to be the revival of the Grecian Empire. Now, the Grecian Empire was run by who originally? It's in your history books. Alexander the Great, all right? And... Uh, and in Daniel, it talks about Alexander the Great and everything he did. And the story is told, I don't know if this is true, that, that he had defeated all the kingdoms that he knew and he sat down and was very discouraged because there was no more kingdoms to, to conquer. But we find out that whenever he died, Daniel spells all this out. Whenever he died, his kingdom went to four different generals. And, those four di and this is history, four different generals that encompass Greece, Turkey, Syria, and Egypt, and the and the four was Cassander, Lysimachus, um, Ptolemy or Ptolemy, and Seleucus. Those were the four generals. Now, out of those four generals, there were battles that went on that that brings down to where the Antichrist will come from, and you're going to find out that the Antichrist is going to come from Syria, because the, the last of all the battles was between Egypt and Syria, and then and then Syria came out on top as you begin to read the book of Daniel and see what happens, and then it pinpoints where the Antichrist will come. So I always tell people, just watch what's happening in Syria. And matter of fact, when we get to the book of Revelation, you'll see that it talks about the kingdom that was, but is not, but will become. It's talking about Syria. There was a time uh, in the Grecian Empire, uh, there was a time where Syria was a very strong was a very strong kingdom. And so, but it's not anymore. So the kingdom that was is not, but yet is going to become, which means the Grecian, the Grecian Empire, which is the revival of the Grecian Empire, will happen, and that's where Antichrist will come from. Now, all that sounds like Greek, doesn't it? You know? <laughs> so anyway, we got, we got four minutes if you have a, a question. All of these represent something, you know, uh, like the alligator and the lion. And all of these, you know, they all represent something. It talks about the four notable horns, you know, in the book of Daniel, which became the, uh, uh, the commanders and whatever. Uh, just a lot of different things that, that I can't really get into right now, but we will as we get into it. Now, there's a, how many of you don't... I, I may try to run off the, just the book of Revelation out of my, my thesis that I wrote for my doctorate. It's, it's scripture by scripture. But how many wouldn't, how many don't have that? If you've got my journey through the Bible, you have it. But how many don't have it? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, okay, nine. I'll, I'll run maybe 10 of them off. Huh? And you guys can have it. Because we're going to go scripture by scripture. I don't want to just cover something without the scripture proving it. So we'll go scripture by scripture. All right. Let me say one last thing. Here's your homework. I want you to read the, uh, in the book of Revelation, I want you to read chapter, 
I want you to read chapter 1 and uh, 2 and 3. All right? And read it. Don't read it just once. You read it more than once. And then uh, you're going to find out that uh, the book of Revelation has been divided into three parts. And the book itself, basically, everything is given in, uh, in, uh, uh, in order as things that happen. Um, uh, it doesn't jump around or whatever, other than the fact there are parenthetical statements. And a parenthetical statement is like a preacher that's preaching, and he's covering a subject, but he, but he, he jumps way ahead to tell you something that hasn't happened. Like in the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation, it talks about uh, the 144,000 being sealed, okay? But they're not, they're not raptured till the 14th chapter. So sometimes there are parenthetical statements that are not in direct order, but they're there to explain something. Now, now why, why does it show us that they were, they were sealed in chapter 7? The reason for that is because when all the, uh, the things happened uh, with the, uh, uh, the seven trumpets, it, uh, it says that those 144,000 were protected from the judgments that were coming. So that's the reason why that it's explained there. Otherwise, we'd say, well, were the 144,000, were, I mean, were, were they subjected to that and whatever? So there are times that there's parenthetical statements. And also there's... Um, uh, uh, what they call um, a double reference at times where, uh, where uh, God may be dealing with a visible person that's being influenced by an invisible person who would be the devil. Does that make sense? All right, just like he said to Peter, I meant when he rebuked Peter, he said, Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Peter wasn't Satan, but he has been influenced by Satan. So whenever you, you start looking at, at, at Satan, I mean, it looks like it, uh, in, uh, in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, it looks like that he's talking to a, a certain ruler, king, or whatever. But uh, he's, he is talking to that person, but he's also talking about the person that's doing the influence. That's the reason why it says about Satan. You can't miss that. Or the, the cherubim, uh, speaking of... Uh, of, uh, of, of Satan. I mean, he was one of the highest order of angels or he wouldn't have been given the earth. You know, a lot of scriptures on that and they're all in my book too, so we can't cover every scripture.